Curiosity was my other. <laughs> 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 no, I think it's George Trump. <laughs> it's hard to say his name, but to this day, when I write emails to him, I just write KK Dash. <laughs> and I sign my name and my students, CMK, in all capitals, and I think I do that because he always signed his emails KK, so that's the kind of things you learn from your advisor. Um, um, so I want to talk first about the center. Um, for future technologies in cancer care at VU, and, and the reason I want to talk about this first is that we are giving away money. <laughs> so, I, um, we have a pre-proposal call which was um, went out, you know, five minutes before the shutdown. My project manager so I was to do this. Um, they're due on November first, and the website for the center is vu.edu/justfpcc, um, and the call is there. Um, basically, anyone who um, is qualifies for applying for an NHR grant will qualify to um, apply for a uh, grant within the center. These are $50,000 direct cost grants. They're focused on translational technologies in cancer care and we're focused primarily on point of care. So the center is um, an, an NIH um, center. It's one of a network of centers. There's one at VU. Um, which is focused on cancer care. There's one at uh, CIMIT or MGH in Boston that's focused on primary care, and there's one at Mount Hopkins that's focused on sexually transmitted diseases. And uh, each of these centers is charged with promoting point of care technologies, point of care diagnostics, um, nationally and sort of in parentheses because it's the NIH. Um, globally. However, um, the focus on global health has started to um, ramp up a little bit and right before the shutdown um, we were supposed to have a meeting um, through the center with, it was advertised as the actual Bill Gates, I don't know if it was, <laughs> or if it was someone from the Gates Foundation, but in any case, um, the foundation was coming to the centers to, to look for um, technologies that are uh, being mentored by the centers. And what we do is we provide people who are having technology, the technology they want to bring out of the laboratory and, and to the bedside um, with clinical needs assessment services, um, intellectual property mentoring, and the other really big thing that we do is prototyping. We do both alpha prototyping and beta prototyping so people can uh, <clears throat> do uh, microfluidic prototyping, uh, instrumentation prototyping, we've done some optical stuff, uh, both at the alpha level and also at the beta level um, in conjunction with the Fraunhofer Center for Manufacturing Innovation, which shares uh, a campus with VU. So this is a national center, and um, as the director of it, it's my job to advertise it, so I'm doing that. And um, we want to give away our money, so send us pre-proposals. And this date might get pushed out a little bit, so watch the website because of the shutdown, they haven't let me know what they want me to do yet. Um, so the rest of the talk <laughs> will be focused on mostly on, on the research that um, I've done in my lab over the last um, eight to 10 years at Boston University. Um, we're focused on point of care diagnostics and in particular on molecular diagnostics. So we're making nucleic acid tests and where we can click acid tests that we hope to uh, deploy in settings that are um, low resource and or low resource in the sense that um, we're not plugging things into the wall uh, in order to run them. So minimally instrumented is, is the term I like to use. We, we are instrumenting things, but we're doing it in the most minimal way we can. Um, <clears throat> this is a really nice paper that came out of BOSS last year and talks about you know, what are the barriers to point of care testing in the infectious disease case, uh, and it has some, some nice figures. Um, but this one shows you, you know, what, what do we mean by, by point of care? Um, in the center, we have a very broad definition of point of care. Uh, in my laboratory, we tend to be more toward the uh, community and, and clinical um, health post definitions. We would like eventually to have uh, home testing in molecular diagnostics for home testing, but um, in my opinion, from having worked in this area for a while, it's a bit, that's, I think that's a little bit ambitious, but you guys are graduate students, so maybe you can prove me, prove me wrong. But all of these fast tests or rapid tests, um, depending on the disease and the metric that you're trying to measure, um, are, are, are happening you know, in a place without um, a whole lot of instrumentation. You can see here, you know, 
hospital or in a peripheral, peripheral lab, you'll have dedicated instruments and or a suite of instruments to run things. So we're, we're focused here in the middle where we're trying to make things that work on their own. Um, since we're in the global health building, uh, I thought I would add a few slides um, <clears throat> to talk a little bit about some of my more recent interest in education in the um, public health area. So um, I work a little bit with um, folks at the Harvard School of Public Health, and one of those people is um, Rebecca Weintraub, who has, along with her colleagues, started to uh, crystallize and really, um, re really push this idea of emphasizing value-based delivery for healthcare. And this is um, a paradigm that I, I like to show to students because it really helps you, I think, think about the technologies that you're developing when you start developing them, before you start actually building something, and you start thinking what, what about your design rules and your functional requirements, and et cetera, et cetera, about what it is, you're, how what you're making is going to have an impact on, on a patient outcome, right? And how, how should we think about that? And it also is very instructive because it's an interesting time in this country, um, these last few weeks in particular, to, <laughs> to think about uh, how we deliver health care uh, to people in, in this country and, and, and how we're going to measure whether we're successful or not, right? And people right now are using you know, just the popular press. We're using very different metrics of success um, when we think about how we're getting people covered um, on the Affordable Care Act and how that coverage is um, you're going, to, going to help or hinder um, competition, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, usually, and I think this is true in, in engineering as well as global health, you know, you used to think about how many services can I provide, how fast can I provide them, and, and how many people um, can I cycle through my system, you know, the PEPFAR system, which is a good you know, PEPFAR clinics are a good example of this. We're going to focus on HIV, we're going to treat as many people as possible, and we're going to be really, really good and efficient at doing it. And now, um, folks who, who, who work in that area will say, well, now we have this great system set up, but we'd like to expand it so that we can do primary care in those facilities, leverage that great structure that we have, and start to deliver more value to the patient who's coming here once a month to get their prescription refilled and to potentially have a diagnostic done. Can we also provide other services? Can we provide nutritional services? Can we provide prenatal care, et cetera? And, and in this country, we're also starting to, to think of this similarly because cost is, is a driver. High cost is a driver here. So you know, the product is, if the product is health, and we think about the whole care cycle of the patient, um, you know, then how do we generate value for that patient? Are patients as a whole getting better? Is the community as a whole getting better? It's not just um, how well our device works, how many of them can we sell, how many of them can we, can we use? Um, and so, you know, this is, this is somewhat controversial, you know, how far you want to go down this pathway, but I, I really like to think, and I encourage my students to think about patient, you know, value to the patient. When you're making this thing, how are you going to change the course of care for this patient? How what is the advantage of, of the to the clinician for using your test versus something else? Um, are, are you going to catch people earlier on in the progression of their disease? And if you are, is that a good thing? Sometimes it's not always a good thing. Um, there are many cases in point uh, of early detection in, in the U.S. in the cancer area where it's not always a good thing. Um, some people will argue that the entire treatment of, of prostate cancer in this country is based on on non-data and, and early detection that may not be, in fact, necessary. So what, what I ask, you know, from the engineering point of view, really, is how do we improve this process and get devices that we make, molecular diagnostics, portable molecular diagnostics, to clinics that need them, or people that need them, or people that want to use them to, to broaden the question. And, you, you know, there, you just stop for one second um, and, and just talk about these these two quotes come from a couple of um, books that, um, that I've recently read. And the bottom one is really good for, for engineering students. Um, this book goes through, this woman is a, um, uh, a pharmacologist who works in the US half of the year and in Nigeria the other half of the year. And she basically took a huge sabbatical and wrote this, this book just looking at the, actually looking at 
the cost benefit analysis from a patient's point of view of diagnostic slabs in Africa. Uh, and, and she really takes this thesis of this test is too expensive and she just destroys it. It's quite, it's quite amazing to, you know, we don't want to do a Roche Amplicor HIV variable load test in Nigeria because it costs too much. And she just basically takes that and just completely, you know, just drives it into the ground using a lot of hard numbers. So it's very appealing for an engineer to read this, this book, but she's also, um, you know, really done her, her homework from the sociology point of view as well. It's pretty, pretty amazing um, book. Uh, but, but really, knowledge is power, right? I mean, what it comes down to, without going into all the arguments in, in the literature, is that if you know what's wrong with you, or if you know what your disease state is, you can take control over over your you know over your own healthcare. You can make decisions that you couldn't previously uh, make. Um, and you're and, and the same is true for the clinician, right? And if the clinician has more information about what's going on with their patient they can make better decisions, they can recommend better courses of care instead of uh, making guesses. And in, in, in the OKK book, there's uh, a nice treatment of um, you know, the difference, you know, fever, non-specific fever, basically. We're talking about how doctors um, just you know, treat to treat when there's non-specific fever and how that actually can not only be uh, not helpful but also harmful. Uh, so, you know, why do we make diagnostics? So, you know, we, we, we want to detect disease. That's the obvious one. That's the one that, that you think of when you're um, a graduate student in an engineering lab and you have a disease and you want to make a new diagnostic. Um, in our lab, we also think about drug adherence monitoring. Um, I won't talk about that today because I don't have enough time. Um, but it's also an important area, and maybe easier in some cases, to work with small molecules. Um, like the like does, it, it, it is, you, you can detect the presence or absence of a metabolite or a small molecule in a body fluid. You can then um, determine whether or not someone's adhering to a therapy, and that has very broad implications and over a number of different disease states. Um, also, eradication programs require diagnostics. How are we going to know if there's no more polio or measles? Only if we have a really, really sensitive diagnostic device. Um, and if we don't have that, then we don't know if eradication has succeeded, and if we want people to pay for eradication programs, we have to prove to them that they're being successful. And if we don't have a diagnostic, we can't do that. The same is true for you know, the emerging disease surveillance. I like to call this the, the sexy one, because that's the one where you get a lot of articles in The New Yorker if you're doing that. I'm detecting something, and I don't even know what it is yet. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of horror stories that you can read about the virus that's going to come eat us all up. Um, but more, you know, we're really ambitious to attack, tackle that, but it's cool. Um, but vaccine development, you know, efficacy studies. So one of the projects I'm involved with um, is a company, the company in San Francisco that's working on HIV viral load test. And their customer is actually um, the U.S. government, but the U.S. Government, the military, because they're interested in, in HIV vaccines and they're interested in having a device that measures whether or not a vaccine test has been, a vaccine test, a test for vaccine efficacy has been effective, right? So that's driving the development of that particular viral load test, um, which is interesting. And if you, you want people to use vaccines, vaccines are paid for in many cases by donors um, or, or the government, you have to convince people that they work. And if you want that to be true, if you want that to be true, you have to be able to test for it. Um, and then, you know, these are things that, that I think of when, when we're designing devices, you know, what, what tests are needed in what context. You know, as a, a lab, we focus primarily on molecular diagnostics, and that, that's because um, I'm only one person, and I only have so many graduate students. Um, and so, so those are the areas we've chosen to focus in. But, you know, medical molecular diagnostics are not the only area. That, that exists, there's agriculture, there's food safety, and there are, are, are really good arguments that the latter two are actually bigger problems um, for, for, some, um, for some communities than, than the medical diagnostics. You actually save more lives, better quality of life if you can detect disease in cattle, for instance, in a particular community, than uh, some diseases in the human medical area. But most importantly is really understanding the social context and understanding the social determinants of health. Why are people sick? 
Why are people sick? How is your how is your diagnostic going to change that dynamic, if at all? Right. Um, and if the answer is it, 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 it might not, then maybe you need to rethink um, the deployment. So I mentioned before we do molecular diagnostics. So um, mostly that what that just means is, is we are focused on um, nucleic acids. We've chosen to, to focus in this area because, in general, molecular diagnostics are more sensitive and specific than um, antibody-based diagnostics. It's not true across the board, but it's true in most cases. Um, we would like to make, so this is you know, your antibody-based test. It's generally a strip-based test. You can, you know, these are pregnancy tests, I think. Um, so what we would like to make is a molecular diagnostic that is as easy to run in the, and is easy to read out. As, as a test like that. That's basically our overall goal. It's not that easy to do, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about our progress in that direction. Because really, in the field, um, or at the point of care, molecular diagnostics don't currently exist. There, there are some good examples of things getting very close. The, the Cepheid um, test, the tuberculosis test, and some of their other tests are very, very close to being point of care tests that give molecular answers. Um, in the field, but a handheld um, device that does what that test does doesn't currently um, exist. In my lab, we've looked at lots of things. Um, I'll talk about flu, um, HIV, and infectious diarrhea a little bit today. We started looking into um, cancer biomarkers as well, so we've sort of come a little bit out of the molecular work and into some protein work. Um, down here is, you know, all the nasty stuff all the sample matrices that we work with. Um, what makes us a little bit different than most labs until recently is we almost always start with human samples from the get-go. Um, and that's because we focus a lot on sample preparation. So we start there. Um, the sample prep process involves a number of different steps. I won't belabor them here, but really what we're doing is we're extracting nucleic acids from complex uh, mixtures. And then we're eluding those nucleic acids into, um, in, into a volume where we do enzymatic conversion amplification, and then we detect, we detect those either fluorescently or by um, a number of other detection methods, which I won't talk about today, um, largely because these, are, these novel detection methods are, are really where my collaborators step in. So, so we're fundamentally sample preparation folks. We do a lot of um, integration, and, and we're now trying to do visual readouts, which I'll talk about at the end of our amplification products. Um, but all of these nice portable sample prep methods are um, turn out to be very attractive to people who are doing things like surface enhanced Raman and um, other interference techniques because nice clean samples uh, make those make those those detection techniques more sensitive and specific as well. So I already said this. Can we make a test with, with the use of a rapid amino assay and the sensitivity of a molecular assay? Um, our challenges, I've, I've already gone over, are primarily sample preparation. These are the ch there are many challenges, but the ones we focus on are primarily sample prep. How can we get nucleic acids that are stable enough, that are clean enough in order to amplify to get a good answer at, 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 the, at the viral load or the uh, bacterial load? Um, that is germane to that particular disease. So in general, when we try to make fully integrated devices, we're following this um, top line. We have a sample, it goes into the device. We do some pre-processing to filter or concentrate. Um, if they're cells, we have to lyse them. Um, we then isolate and purify the DNA and the RNA. If we have RNA, we need to convert it to DNA. After we do that, uh, we do amplification and, and then detection. Um, so, what are, in the talk, I'll, I'll just give you a few examples of, of places we've done that, starting with the most complicated and coming down to um, the more simplified version. So when we started out, we um, started out making these integrated microfluidic devices, um, which are on the bottom here. We, we started out on the, this is an array on the top here. Um, all of these guys are the same thing. They're all basically solid phase extraction columns packed into a thermal plastic chip. Um, you can make these in a number of ways. How we make them is by um, polymerizing a uh, pre-polymer solution that contains uh, origin, and in some cases in this picture, it does also contain second phase particles. In this case, they're, they're silica. 
we fill the channel after the channel is already made. We UV cross link it um, through the channel so we can control where the um, salt phase extraction column ends up being. And then that column is open. It has an open pore structure. The pore distribution centers around um, two microns. And what that allows us to do is force the sample um, through that small channel and then through this torturous open pore structure. Um, and that, in the presence of a chemical lysis buffer, will break open cells and then also um, shear. So the cells can, they're chemically shearing, they're chemically opening, but they're also shearing as they get forced through um, the column. But the column itself, um, lives inside of the integrated chip. There's one, you know, here, this is an HVA chip that we, we made um, to detect E. coli. And then this is a food chip, which I'll talk about in more detail. And it lives up, up top here, this is the front of the chip, and this is the end. Uh, yep. Okay, so, so what's the other part, I mean the lower part of the... I, I'll go into it, I'll, I'll, oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> I just realized my slides are a little bit out of order, so good <laughs> Um, but, so, so, so what's happening in here, let me see what the next slide is, it's going to be a surprise for all of us. Oh, good. Um, what's happening inside the solid phase extraction column is that if anyone, you know, if you've ever used like a chiogen kit to spin down your sample, you know, to, to extract nucleic acids, that's basically what's happening here. In the presence of a high salt buffer, the nucleic acids that are liberated from the cells, viruses, etc. Uh, will preferentially bind to the silica solid phase. It turns out it'll also they also will preferentially bind to acrylate polymers uh, without the second phase particles there. So that's that ended up being a nice um, simplification in the process. Then you can wash away everything else with a dry wash, like an ethanol wash or other mixed alcohol wash. And then you can elude in a low salt buffer or water. And then when you elude that sample, what you have if you elude in a smaller amount of buffer than what you started with you have a concentrated nucleic acid sample that you can then send downstream to amplify. And that's the rest of the stuff in the chip. I like to, but I have a question. So, uh, do you do this uh, salt buffer arsenal and the low salt buffer in... In, in sequence. In, in, so not, not what, uh, in repeats, right? First, first salt, then Know yeah, there are no repeats. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's good. It may be more than one column volume in yeah. case of dirtier samples. Uh, so when you're dealing with like C. diff, you have a ground positive bacteria, it's hard to break open. Mm -hmm. And you have stool. So you have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, inhibitors to wash away. Oh, uh, in that case, you may repeat um, the ethanol wash more than once. So can I understand is that? Uh, uh, Microfluid uh, pipeline. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And you're introducing one buffer after the other in a straight line, and you collect what's waste, and then you flip the valve, and you let the eluent go downstream for amplification. Cool. cool. Um, so I'll talk about flu. So sample prep wise, before I get into the integrated chips part. Uh, sample prep wise, we did this with any number of things. Um, influenza A, um, Ebola, not actually Ebola, it's BSV, it's an Ebola pseudotype, but I love, I love viruses. I just think they're so fascinating. So <laughs> I love, I, I have this like weird fascination with books about Ebola, so <laughs> I've read like every single one. Um, so when a colleague came to me who is a virologist and said, I want to detect, you know, Ebola pseudotypes, can you prepare these? And I said, can I go in the BSL 4 Can I go in there and like see it? He's like, you can go have a tour right now because we're not up yet. But as soon as we're up, you can go to the conference room. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm allowed to go into the conference room of a building that has a BSL 4 <laughs> That's it. I said, what if I quit now and study virology instead? He said, no, it's too late. <laughs> it takes like years to be able to wear that suit. I said, all right. So it's good enough. I can put it on my slide. Um, but we've, you know, we've done this with urine and blood and stool and vaginal swabs, and all these things are going into the same column, and we're basically just changing you know, the ratios of the, of the lysis buffer and the, and, the, and the wash and the elution and the elution, uh, components in order to get back what we want to get back so that we can amplify it when we're done. Um, you can see this is a study where we purposely kept hitting the thing with um, 
bacteria that are more and more difficult to lyse, and as the cell wall gets stronger, your limit of detection goes up because you, you can't break these things apart. So you have like a combined um, effect. The more difficult it is to break open the bacteria, uh, the longer you have to impede it with the, the chemistry. You can't just, like with E. coli, everything just breaks up when you push it and you shear it through the, the channel. Um, but you can break open uh, Ethocolis and, and C. diff. You just have to um, increase the amount of time that, that lysis is um, occurring. In any case, once we were done you know, doing the sample prep stuff, we decided to um, work on integrating this into first into a microfluidic chip and then into some minimally instrumented systems. And, and I'll talk about flu with HIV and C. diff here. So flu was really the first um, the first disease that we tackled. Um, we chose flu for a number of reasons. Um, we chose flu before the pandemic. Um, and we chose it because it was a swab sample, um, because flu is, is relatively easy to lyse, and because people who have flu um, at the early stages have a fairly high viral load in, in their nasal pharynx. So, um, and at the time, um, we proposed the work in 2007, um, it was pretty well known already that the rapid influenza tests based on antibody um, recognition were not very sensitive or specific. Then um, we got our money and we started working on our R01. And then the, uh, we started collecting samples. So we built this microfluidic chip that did the sample prep steps, followed by a reverse transcription reaction because it's an HIV, uh, it's a RNA virus. Um, like HIV, and then a PCR on chip using um, a um, a serpentine channel. And PCR? yep. So, so you can do PCR on the microfluidic chip? Yes. Oh, that's amazing. I'll talk about it in a second. So we want to compare it. We thought in 2007, we thought, oh, we'll compare it to the rapid tests that are out there. That'll be our gold standard. We were doing um, plaque assays and, and, and other assays in the laboratory. We were having a very, very hard time in 2008 getting samples from people. Um, it turns out scraping someone's nasopharynx with their band nose is not very comfortable, and if you're telling them, I just want this from you, there's no benefit to you, um, they don't comply. And then even more, if you say, I want this from your two-year-old kid, and I'm not going to give you anything, um, they don't comply either. But all of a sudden, we were getting tons of samples, like all of, the, you know, all of a sudden. In 2007, 2008 season, we didn't move barely on any samples. We thought we're never going to meet our quota. And age is down our, you know, on my case. We don't have enough samples. And then all of a sudden, bam, 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 we're getting tons of samples. I called the respiratory folks. I said, what are you doing? And they said, nothing. Everyone is sick. And sure enough, within a week, it was like, we're, we're Boston was part of the pandemic. And it was great news for us, bad news for everyone else. <laughs> really bad news for the rapid diagnostics. So what happened was, um, these folks, um, Ginocchio and her colleagues in um, New York, were, had always been doing, all along, PCR on flu every year um, as, as, as part of a study to show that these rapid diagnostics were not good. And when the pandemic came, they continued doing branch top PCR, as we were, and we were also doing chip-based PCR. I was able to come out um, very quickly in July of 2009 and show that the, the guidance should be that the rapid test is not um, sensitive for influenza, period. We shouldn't be using it based on, on PCR-based techniques, and we should just treat. If the test is negative, just treat the person as if you never gave them a test. Um, so a uh, number of the, the places we were working with stopped giving the rapid test altogether. Uh, so here, here's the chip. So we had this chip where we you know, put in the nasal, oh, there's the nasal swab. Uh, nasal swab goes into a um, lysis buffer, which just looks like the normal carrying buffer that people take these swabs into, which all of a sudden everyone wanted to take because they were doing RT-PCR at the state labs and they were taking samples at the state labs as well, so it became very easy for us to get these samples. Samples loaded into the chip in the lysis buffer already, goes over the solid phase extraction column, um, you can see there's two chips up here. It's a one-way pump. Um, there's a waste valve here, so waste is coming out. Um, and then we're pulling in this case. The sample goes in and we're pulling, we're pulling the buffers. And then um, once we are ready to push the alleyway, we just switch over 
push the aluate through into the uh, reverse transcription channel and use a one pot of RT-PCR reaction. So this guy has a heater underneath it. It heats up, I think it's 50 degrees C. It's been a while now. Uh, we did the full 20 minutes here because this was uh, something we didn't change. We didn't engineer this um, in the original design. And then after the RT, we just push into here. This heater is up at around 100. This heater is down at 55. And the sample cycles from 100 to 55. And then out the other end comes uh, the amplified product, which we ran in a Cepheid chip to look for the uh, peak. And we use the CDC assay for the M1 gene in, uh, in influenza A. So we weren't at that time able to detect the novel H1N1. Um, specifically because we weren't allowed, it was another maddening thing, we weren't allowed to use their assay because it was proprietary and then after we started doing all these tests, they made it free to everyone because um, there was a pandemic. But in any case, this is how the PCR works. Um, we made a, a fluidic, thermal fluidic model of the thing because if you're a graduate student and you make chips, you know that if your, grad, if your um, advisor comes to you and says, well, I need you to change the thermal history in that PCR chip. That means you have to go make a whole new chip, right? I mean, you do have one control, and that's the flow rate. Um, but unless you change the geometry of the chip, you aren't able to change the ratio between the denaturation, the annealing, and the extension times, right? Um, you can make it all go faster, all go slower. But if you want to change the ratio between those times, you have to change the width of the, of the channel. So my students made, made a nice model, and then they tested it, and then they tested a bunch of designs in silico, and then they tested, this is the real data, showing that the temperatures are actually the temperatures, uh, and then determined that the cycle time, optimal cycle time, in, and the optimal uh, amplification product, the optimal product yield was somewhere around 30 seconds and it was a design that looked most like B. So this was nice, because now we can tweak all these things, make them longer, make them shorter, and then test them using different amplicon sizes. But of course, um, you know, that's all preliminary. So we were able to take um, samples from patients, and in the end, um, we got a lot of samples, many, many more samples than we needed. Um, but we had uh, 146 samples that we tested using the fluidic assay, 119. Um, that's the subset that we're testing using the rapid immuno assay before it was discontinued uh, in Boston Medical Center. And then we tested everything using benchtop RT PCR as our uh, old standard control. And we were able to get, um, with our fluidic assay, we were able to get sensitivity and specificity that was approaching the benchtop real time PCR. So that was nice because that's, that's what we hoped for. Uh, but we were also able to show in concurrence with the folks uh, who, who were, who were um, analyzing the rapid diagnostic tests that in our hands, or in the hands of our laboratory, our, our clinical laboratory, that the sensitivity of the rapid diagnostic test was about 50%. So it was bad um, and as expected. And so uh, because lots of people ask me which test, it doesn't really matter. They are all bad, but the tests are are down there that we used um, a Ravel test and a uh, expect test. So that was great, but we felt like after we did that, what we learned from that study was that we spent a lot of time and effort running those chips. You know, they're fairly complicated and things break, right? So we ended up at this pathway, and you asked me this question earlier, should I spend a lot of time automating something, or should I um, focus more on you know, the, the science part of what I'm doing? And we were asking ourselves that exact question at this point. Um, should we spend a lot of time automating this process so that folks could take this into the ER or into their hospital room, or should we try to figure out what it is that we do best, that we can contribute, um, and, and make that what we focus our, our time and energy on. And we, we decided to do the latter. Um, and, and a lot of that was motivated by just simply um, the FDA fast-tracked a lot of molecular flu tests at, that, at the time of the pandemic. And so we kind of got left behind as an academic lab. But that's good. I mean, molecular flu tests now exist. They're not widely used, but um, they, they do exist and they are in the mar marketplace when previously um, they were not. So we said, well, we're really good at sample prep, so let's focus on that and let's see how we can do that 
with minimal instrumentation so that we can deliver sample prep or highly purified nucleic acids in a stable way to folks who want to do an array of molecular diagnostics in an array of locations. Uh, so we, and we were hoping to do that by, you know, we were hoping to, to, to make eliminating the cold chain for molecular diagnostics part of our goal. So if we could extract nucleic acids in the field and store them and ship them without a cold chain, then maybe we, can, we could bring uh, something like an HIV viral load test to a population that currently would have to give a, 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 a full blood um, sample that would have to go in a cold chain to another location and it may not be uh, good when it gets there. Um, if we could shift the task um, out to the field. So we did that by building this guy, um, which is complicated looking, but it's actually not that complicated. <laughs> um, we've, all the parts are off the shelf. Um, the sample is a sample from a patient, so you take a, a, you take a, you could take a finger prick if you wanted to, um, and insert it into the introduction syringe, or you could use venipuncture if you wanted to. And then the sample is um, pushed into the sample, and the, the lysis buffer is in the next syringe. The ethanol wash is in the next syringe. And then these guys um, could be water, if you wanted to leave your sample at the site and do the next step, or um, preservative that we push over the column in order to dry out the column and make the nucleic acids more stable for shipping. And then, of course, this is a prototype. so. This part is just a pipette tip that has the solid phase extraction column in it. After you run it, um, you have nucleic acids living on that, um, that solid support. And if you dry them out enough, um, and if, if, if you dry them out enough and or if you use a preservative, we haven't had much luck with preservatives being better than simply really, really drying out your sample. Um, you put it in a Ziploc bag with a little piece of silica gel in a little packet. Um, you can ship those around without a cold chain. And so this is just showing that what's inside of that little system is that same solid phase extraction column that we've been using all along, slightly modified, and that the system itself is not plugging into the wall. All of these syringes are being pressed by hand, and the pressure that pushes everything over the solid phase extraction column is entered at one point um, through, a pressure, through a pressure accumulator on the thing which you load with a bicycle pump. So you have this bicycle pump, we have one that we pump with our hands, but you can also, we took it to Nicaragua, and we bought a bunch of bicycle pumps, and we hook them all up, and we work with those as well. So what this allowed us to do then, we start to say, okay, well, if we can extract um, nucleic acids and store you know, from samples in the field, that's great, but can we extract, what we specifically wanted to do was extract uh, HIV RNA from whole blood and be able to quantitatively tell the difference between people who were at different logs of viral load. And so that's what this data is showing. The data on the left is showing that yes, from six to five to four to three logs. Um, we don't have the two log data because we are running our own PCR and not, uh, not the uh, proprietary PCR. Um, but we can tell statistically the difference between people with different viral loads, and it is quantitative. And we do when we compare ourselves to a Kyogen kid in a traditional laboratory, do just as well without putting anything into the wall. Uh, out, in, you know, we try to, you know, we did it in a hotel room <laughs> in Nicaragua. That's about as far out in the field as, as we got. Um, turned out the hotel room was maybe cleaner than the lab um, <laughs> that we were working in. But for time constraints, we, we did it in the hotel room. Um, but what we see here is this, which we, which we see a lot, which is if you use a Kyogen kit to extract very small amounts of RNA or DNA from complicated samples, you often cannot get those samples to amplify using PCR, and that's because the samples are not clean enough. Um, there are, at least the Kyogen kit will leave behind a lot of inhibitors if you have very low amounts of nucleic acid. If you just take that sample and run it over the Kyogen column again, or you dilute it by, ten time, by 1 to the 10, um, it'll run. Um, it's there, it's just not um, amplifiable. So we're getting cleaner uh, product and we're getting product easier without plugging into the wall. Then we started to um, think about can we store these things and ship them around? And the answer is yes, we can keep a different chunk for one day. Um, this is RNA, so pretty, you know, they stuff. Uh, 37 degrees, you know, up to a week. And then after 
you know, two weeks, we start losing it. It's no longer quantitative. Um, but this is without any preservative. It's just drying. Uh, lots of folks have different preservatives that they were trying to use with our method, and we'll see um, if that works. But the, the question is now, if you can store it for one week, is that enough? Uh, you know, generally when we talk with people do, doing needs assessment stuff, you know, they basically say two weeks would be great because then you would completely eliminate the, the problem with the cold chain. People want to work seven to, you know, seven to ten days is what people usually say for getting to the lab. But could this be an alternative to a dry blood spot? Right, the dry blood spot is not quantitative. The lower limit of detection is about 4,000 copies. Um, it may be a way to assess viral load in the field. So then we, we, we moved on to doing amplification. So now we, we can extract these nucleic acids in the field without plugging them into anything. So can we also um, amplify them in the field without plugging anything into anything? Um, and so my postdoc decided to go out to the drugstore Someone asked me earlier this, today, why did you make this decision instead of to use these toe warmers that are in an exothermal reaction instead of using the phase change materials? And I said, well, my postdoc went to the drugstore. <laughs> he had two dollars, and this is what he bought. Um, <laughs> and he made the device, and it worked. Like nothing ever works the first time, and it it, it worked. The first it was amazing. We had HDI already worked out, and it was for this particular study. So it wasn't you know, like we just pulled it out of the air, but it actually worked. So we went, we went with it. Um, but it's true. It is, using an exothermic reaction is not the most ideal way of doing this. Phase change material is a much better way of doing this. But um, what this allows you to do is take your extracted nucleic acids and put them into a you know, microfluidic chip or, or a suitably thin um, vessel smash it between the two tone warmers, and then you put it in your little calorimeter from high school, and you control the airflow by having a holesy punch in the side of it. And by doing that, you can control the temperature actually quite well. Um, and for HDA, you want to be around 62 degrees C for 25 minutes in order to get amplification, which we're able to do. And there's more details um, in the paper, there are a lot of details in the paper because, of course, the reviewers came back and said, well, what if it's a humid day? <laughs> what if it's a hot day? What if it's a cold day? And I said, I know these are all good points. So um, we went back and we sort of made all these look-up tables for doing that. But if you used a phase change material, you wouldn't have to worry about this. But we used this for um, detecting um, infectious diarrhea in um, stool samples. So. Now that everyone's done eating, we can get to the stool part of the talk. Um, so basically, we took the stool samples, and by, you know, when someone has um, Clostridium difficile, a um, stool sample is actually quite watery. So we had these samples, we extracted the DNA from them using the portable um, nucleic acid extraction device, and then we removed them, we took that DNA, we put it into the device I just showed you, um, along with the HDA enzyme, um, helicase-dependent amplification. What helicase does is the helicase unwinds the double-stranded DNA and then the polymerase comes along and amplifies it. So that can happen at one temperature. You don't have the thermal cycle. And um, the positive people came up positive, and the negative people came up negative, which was good. Um, the water came up water, came up negative, and um, the genome DNA came up positive. So in these little chips, we had always, you know, a positive and a sample and a negative, um, which was a little bit tricky at first because you don't contaminate your sample with your positive control. Uh, but that that worked out nicely. But we're still reading it out right on gel, which we had to plug into the wall. So you you know not only do you have to plug it into a wall, you, you need a power supply, right? So we start to think now, okay, well how are we going to you know think about ways to to read this out without um, without using um, you know, something that, that has to plug into the wall. So around the time that we finished up with that study, um, we had a long-standing collaboration with this company, Biohelix, which just got bought by a company called Kaidel, which I think is partially owned by Kaijin. <laughs> so they no longer are interested in um, this game, but we are. Um, and they've been nice enough to let us continue on this area. but. Um, so basically, you amplify the nucleic acids, but when you're amplifying the nucleic acids, you include a probe just like you would in a TAC-man assay, right? And instead of, it, instead of your probe being fluorescent, 
and that's the fluorescence you're looking for. Your probe is a small molecule, which in this case is in the fluorescent molecule, uh, but you also have an antibody, readily available antibodies against those fluorescent probes. So you amplify your product and your control. In these cases, in, these, this, in this real data, we only have a test in a control line. This is actually for uh, vaginal swabs uh, with uh, gonorrhea. And we are looking at 10 to the 6 or 2 and 0 uh, colonies per. It's not on the slide. I love it. OK. But I think it's just CFU per mil. It's, it's, the, it's the most simple thing. Um, and so what, what you do then is you extract the nucleic acid using the, the portable system, and then you amplify it using the uh, using, using a heat block in this case. Uh, and then you can run up the sample on a lateral flow strip, just like you would run up a sample on a lateral flow strip when you're doing um, an antibody assay uh, for a pregnancy test, for instance. Except now your antibodies are against this probe that's on your, your nucleic acid. Um, and you, you have enough there to detect because you've amplified it ahead of time. And you can also cut down on the amplification time because you don't need as much there um, to, to read it out. You know, you, you, can, you can have um, antibody, you, know, you can use uh, branching techniques in order to read out what's happening on here. But in any case, in this case, you know, somewhere around 10 um, CFU per mil, we're not able to see it anymore. This is just the gel confirming that result. But, but now we have you know, all of those parts, right? So now what my students are working on in the lab is putting together all of those parts. Um, and first, for the chlamydia gonorrhea test, we'd like to have um, a triplex where we have a control of chlamydia and gonorrhea all in the same cartridge. And the cartridge itself, uh, would be heated, would be the heated part with the readout. So there would be an extraction part and then a cartridge. So three parts to two, and then eventually someday maybe two parts to one. Um, so just to close a little bit here, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit to the engineers again. And this is a, a slide that, this, this is a diagram you've probably all seen from Sam Sia's uh, lab on a chip paper. And he, um, wrote a great review uh, a couple of years ago, a year ago, talking about you know, the device value chain, basically. You know, how do we get these, why are these devices not in the field yet, right? What's going wrong? And uh, you know, he focuses a lot on these hard problems, you know, reagent storage, um, you know, uh, cold chain. Uh, you know, how, do we, how do we talk, you know, how do all these chips talk to each other? Uh, what are all the parts that can break? Um, and I think I would just say to to you know, to, to students, postdocs, that, that we just need to remember who is the customer for these things, right? So I just took you through all this minutia of of, of, of how I'm going to make these minimally instrumented devices for these disease states, and I'm happy to talk more about why we were motivated in each case to look at those disease states. But really thinking about what are the needs and it, and, 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 and how is what you are going to make going to fit those needs? And, and really stand back, and then, and then how you know, these things that we make are going to affect patient outcomes. And if they're not working, let's not just make it a pilot thing that we try once, right? Let's, let's have a culture of, of improvement. Let's come back to the table and learn from, from what, what we did wrong. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of these because it's dark. <laughs> um, but I do want to say I have a lot of collaborators in you know low resource settings and disease burden countries. So we want to put it in the countries that are poorer than ours. Um, and there are ways to make these collaborations mean more than just getting samples from someone who happens to live in a country where they have a high burden of the disease that you're interested in. And 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 those. That, you know, really comes down to, to respect and professional respect, and, and I think making sure that you include folks in, in things like authorship and educational resources and dissemination is really key. And I, I've just seen a lot of people 
go around and say, you know, I want to I want to do a project and I'm going to take it to I'll say Zambia because that's where our engineers with our people go. I'm going to take it. I'm going to deploy it, and then the students come back and it's like, well. What did you learn? And they know everything that they learned, but it's like, well, what did the people that you were there working with learn? What did you leave behind? What's the next step? What are you going to do next year? It's like a lot of times that is connection is, is not there. And um, I think that you know, open access is important. I mean, I've talked about this a lot. <laughs> and what I mean by open access is like plus one, <laughs> you know, like publish in an open access journal so that everyone can have access to it. This is huge. I can't tell you how many people have contacted me because of these class papers from you know, far from places saying, I want to use your thing. You know, I want, I want, I want you to come and show me how to do this. Where other paper, you know, yeah, maybe they're not going to cite me, right? Um, because maybe in, in whatever they're doing is publication is not the metric of success. Um, but no one is going to rarely would someone call me about an analytical chemistry paper, I guess, is what I'll say. Um, <laughs> have to complain. Uh, but early collaboration, you know, early collaboration, you know, really saying like, okay, I want to work on this disease and that, that affects this place. Let me go talk to the people who are working in this place. What are your problems? How, how might you solve it? What ways have you thought about solving this problem that you can't because you don't have the resources? Maybe I can provide the, you know, graduate student man and woman power to help work on that problem and then you can give me input, you know, through a Skype meeting or whatever and we can bring it back and then the student can own that. I, you know, I could preach about this all night, but I won't. But I'll give you one last story um, and that is, this was uh, in a Gordon conference in Switzerland, it's beautiful, right? Um, in 2012 and I was really sick. Um, <laughs> I was giving it, I gave a talk and I couldn't really talk and I, I was just miserable and I was going home and I wanted NyQuil because I didn't want to get on the plane because of the ear thing and the ugh, it's horrible and I went into the uh, pharmacy in Switzerland and I busted out my high school French to tell them I have a cold what kind of cold a normal cold or allergy I'm like oh my god I don't know I just want NyQuil I just want this to end and I get you know bringing more people are coming out and I'm just like, just give me something and then they bring out the spray and I'm, I don't want the spray I want NyQuil and I'm all like on the phone like trying to show NyQuil and I you know I learned from my phone that they don't they're smart they don't sell mixed products with acetaminophen in, the, um, in a lot of Europe because it's really really bad for you um, to mix those to, mix, to take too much acetaminophen um, so the guy's asking me, then, are you pregnant? And I'm like, oh, I know this word from French class, but I, I know this is a word. I know he's asking me something. Am I something? I'm like, but I don't know what it means. And all of a sudden, some lady comes from behind and says, he wants to know if you're pregnant. <laughs> I was like, no, I am not. Can I have NyQuil? And she's like, you're not getting NyQuil. Just take the spray. Go home. <laughs> so I took the spray, and I went out into this into this train station, I was waiting to get on the train to go back to Geneva, and I'm just so mad. Oh god, I, silence is beating me down, I can't talk, I can't get NyQuil, it's horrible, I'm just going to have some chocolate. So I go to the <laughs> machine to get some chocolate, and I look at this machine, and there's a pregnancy test in the, in the, in the candy machine, <laughs> <laughs> right there. With no guy asking me if I'm pregnant or anything else. I mean, it is next to some cigarettes, but it's still right there. And I thought, oh, God, okay, this is so enlightened. Like, can you imagine? I mean, I grew up in a pretty small town outside of Chicago, and I think, can you imagine if there was a pregnancy test in the Coke machine down by the hardware store in this small town, how many lives would have been changed? By having this information, you know, you know, fourteen-year-old girls, fifteen-year-old girls, like how many people's lives would have been changed if they had this information like early, and that they could act on it. They didn't have to go talk to some adult, and they didn't have to go give loose some, you know, glass thing or whatever at the at the drugstore. I mean, it's huge. So in some ways, in Switzerland, they're very enlightened about point of care diagnostics, and I think that <laughs> this we could have this. For a lot of things, we could have. We don't have this in this country, but it would be really interesting if we did. Um, so I'll leave you with that. These are the people who do all the work. Um, on the left, 
and the people who give me all the samples are on the right. Um, and I can do any of it without them because the clinicians are, are really the people who um, you know, see this stuff every day and, and help me write the RFPs and collect the samples. And it's really, I mean, my group couldn't work the way it works without all these folks. And then, of course, the money. And I'll just mention one more time the center because if people are doing work in, in cancer diagnostics and not just diagnostics and treatment, um, drug delivery would be responsive um, to, to a point of care technology. Please enter the pre-proposal. Um, we really want to give out you know, five to eight of these things this year and there's a lot more benefits um, to working with the center than just with the PK um, direct costs. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I know it's late. <laughs> not that easy to do that with a foreign institution. It can be done. Um, the, if you already have a relationship with, with that foreign institution, then it becomes, you, then it's easier to convince a study section that this is something real that you, that you have in place. So I, I, I say as early as possible, and if you're working with, if you're working with clinicians and scientists at that level, you know, that person is a peer to you, right? It's not like you're coming in to a community and saying, I want to make this thing and deploy it, and you have nothing, you have nothing to, to show them, right? But if you, if you approach a peer and you say, well, okay, I'm thinking of working on this idea, and then they say, okay, you go back and forth, and, and you develop a proposal uh, to do that. I, I've learned a lot doing it that way. Um, and I, but I, I've done it the other way too, or do it first, find collaborators later. Um, but then you have to be completely prepared to change everything you've already done, because you find out everything else, everything you did wrong, which is a good thing. That's what I, mean, I think. That's a good thing. <laughs> but I, I have tenure, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm allowed. I'm allowed yeah. to. I'm allowed to, to think that. I, I, three years ago, I might not have thought that, right? I might have said, no, 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 don't ever do anything that you don't have a, a good uh, strategy plan for. But, but right now, I feel very much, I, I, I definitely, I have collaborators in Kenya where we, you know, our relationship has been building, you know, we, we met in person, you know, a, a year and a half ago, and then we had a number of Skype meetings, and then we wrote um, a review paper together. An opinion paper together, and now, only now, if you're doing all of that, it's like, okay, let's, we're both interested in this, let's work on this proposal. You guys can propose it from your end to your government, you know, see what happens. We'll propose it on our end to ours, and maybe some foundations, and then, and then we'll try and move forward. And that, to me, seems like it will have the most likely, you know, for success in terms of getting the science done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, Question. Uh, sorry, is um, talking with people who kind of work in the development world, it seems a lot of, especially with technologies, you know, you have the technology, you send a small group, and you do your needs assessment, and then all that data just kind of gets hidden, or, you know, in terms of just better assessing what the needs are, especially with somewhat similar technologies, they're really, as far as I understand, there really isn't. Like it depends on who's doing the needs assessment, like a, right? There's like a database or like you know 
a journal or maybe there is that I'm unaware of just to there's a, there's, data. there's someone at MIT who is trying to do exactly what you said. They're trying to start a journal that would that would focus on these technologies and these assessments for low re technologies in low resource settings. I can't remember the guy's name right now, but I'll send you his name. Um, and that's what he wants. He's saying, like, I want to, to make a forum where people can do these things. And, and some of what we've done in the center is we've said, we're going to completely separate the science projects from the clinical needs assessments. We're going to go in and we're going to have people from the School of Public Health and people who are you know, doctoral students in the School of Public Health work on a clinical needs assessment using the rigorous methodologies that people use to do this without the preconceived notion of, I want to solve this science problem. And then they are in the process of doing that right now, and then they, they will come back to us and say, you know, the number one cancer in this place is X. The time when people die is Y. The biggest barrier to treatment is Z. And there's no, that the, the people doing that assessment and the people being questioned, we would hope, wouldn't have in their minds, ah, I do molecular diagnostics, so I really hope that a molecular diagnostic is going to be the thing that solves everything. Um, so we're trying to separate those functions, and then we would publish a paper, like a bona fide, maybe someday, uh, actually publish a bona fide public health paper with, with these folks, where they, where they just say, these are the needs in this, you know, in, in this, you know, in, in our case, we're, we're looking, you know, our first needs assessment is in urban, uh, low income urban settings in the United States, and then the second will be overseas. Um, and so, by doing that, then we hope, at least as a center, to be able to say, okay, this is the need we want your technology to address, not, unfortunately, what we had to do now because of the shutdown, which is say, well, bring us your technologies and we'll pick the best ones. Uh, but the, the, the long-term goal is to say, these are the needs that we've assessed as a center, and now let's bridge the gap between the technologists and the, and, and the health folks and try to figure out how to meet those needs instead of what I think happens now at least what happened what's been true in my career up until now which is I have something great <laughs> help me help me deploy it help me find the best place to deploy it yeah now, I, so I'm in the school of public health and I, I would say your your question your two answers to her questions they sort of go together because encouraging the students to collaborate early on it, you know what I'm saying she's yeah, asking yeah. about when do you start these collaborations so the question one, but with question two, you're talking about collaborations with public health practitioners. Right. And those, I think you would agree that those collaborations should start very early on. Yeah. In, you know, the early careers Because of it's the a engineers. language that yeah. is. And you know, even here, even yeah. here at Berkeley, I'm probably the only public health person from school of public, public health, and they're all from engineering, <laughs> right? And we're, we're way on the other side of campus, and this, the graduate students really don't connect, and then that happens really in their yeah. careers too, right? But, and I think that's what you're trying to yeah. help them to understand, that especially early careers start well, collaborating. Well, and then the, the language is so different, like at, like at BU, the School of Public Health. And uh, a good, a, a mentor of mine happens to be in charge of the Center for um, Global Health in the School of Public Health. And she is by training a, a scientist, a biochemist. She's not trained in public health. Um, she's administrator and she was telling me, oh this is great, you're doing technology global health, I'll introduce you to the technology global health people over at our center, it's so exciting, and I thought, you have those people? Oh my gosh. And I go over and it turns out the technology and global health people in the BU School of Public Health, at least at that time, you know, four years ago, were people who were saying, we're deploying blankets to babies, you know, to every mother who has a baby so that the baby can be warm when they're born and we're teaching mothers how to use ethanol instead of you know, other pace on the umbilical cord and this is bringing you down and it's like yeah that's the need and they're meeting you know they're meeting that need and they're, they're doing an, you know they're doing an intervention study to determine whether that intervention is positive or negative but like my students are all like what they're giving people blankets that's not <laughs> <laughs> a blanket a mosquito net it's 
the answer is mosquito net. I'm not interested in that. I want you know the next lab on a chip paper. But we, we actually oh. have that. Yeah, we also, we yeah. actually have a, a two centers over public health, but even if none of them are here, this is exactly the problem, right? We have the Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases. Yeah. And so yeah. We have you know Center for Global Public Health, but where are they? Right? These guys the are having a hackathon, right? They're having a hackathon. I know you don't know what that is because I didn't know what it was until two weeks ago. ago. Those are the kind of things I'm worried about on my email, right? Is that what they yeah. <laughs> right. But they should have the public health students come. We had one. We had the public. We had public health students come. We had clinicians come. The guy who, one of the guys who won the thing was a graphic designer. I mean, it was completely like crazy. Like all the different um, multidisciplinary teams that got made up um, at that thing. But the, you didn't find those people. We're trying. We're trying. Get them excited. Yeah, they're, they're trying. It's like that's what you know. It's they're the people. Like, they're the people who say on their application to their MPH, "I want to work on mobile health application." That's the person you want to find. That's the person. Because then once you start talking to them, then immediately you're talking the same language with them. That's what I want. Yeah. I'm a recent graduate with an MPH, so. Oh, good. Okay. Stop okay. telling everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Epidemiology. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Congratulations. So, yeah, me. <laughs> so, I'll let you guys go to the stuff with the team. But thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.